Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend and mentor, Gregory Giusdanis. Gregory is humanities distinguished professor and professor of modern Greek studies at the Ohio State University, where he has worked for nearly 30 years. His interests and passions, however, extend far beyond the culture of Greece. He's written five books on topics as diverse as the poetry of Kavafi, the virtues of nationalism, a defense of literature, and most recently, Friendship from Antiquity to the Present, um, entitled A Tremendous Thing, Friendship from the Iliad to the Internet. He's now at work on two more books simultaneously. When it comes to awards, suffice it to say that whereas most scholars dream of scoring one national award, Gregory has won four. He's been invited to give keynote addresses and seminars the world over, including San Juan, Bogota, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, the London School of Economics, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Lagos, Nigeria, Sydney, Fez, Morocco, and Alexandria, Egypt. He speaks Greek, Macedonian, German, French, and now even Spanish. I invited Professor Giusana to speak today because his journey from peasant to professor to penseur, a story of transcending your limits, is one of inspiration. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gregory Giustanis. Thank you all, can you hear me? Thank you for coming here. I had a great opportunity this morning to speak to some students and faculty members about friendship and during the break in the library, I also met some interesting people and on Saturday I participated in this uh, service learning assignment in which we're serving uh, sandwiches uh, around. Anyway, what I'd like to speak to you uh, about is education, the power of education, and most of the time we think of education as enabling us the opportunity to change and to gain new perspectives. And I would say the most important thing you can gain in education is the capacity to empathy, as you heard this morning, and that is I define empathy as the capacity to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and to try to understand their perspective. I'm going to talk about this, but I'm also going to talk about how education can contribute to a certain loss, and loss to people that come from small rural backgrounds, loss to people who change classes, social classes in order to come to university, and also to those that come from uh, different racial and ethnic backgrounds, because they lose their backgrounds. I want to begin with a story. I was sitting once in my office, it was a sunny day, and I could feel the sun streaming behind me on my oak desk, and there was a student who came to me from a small place in Ohio. And she told me that after completing her education, she would never be able to go back to Chillicothe. She said she found it very, very limiting. Although her family was there, friends was there, she could never go back to live there. And I told her, I know what she meant. This I experienced myself. I changed social classes twice. I changed countries four times. This is the fifth and I think final country where I want to live. And I said, I know what it means to gain and to lose. So I want to begin then with my life as growing up in this very t small village in Greece. I was born in northern Greece in a village of about 150 people where there was no electricity and no running water. We, of course, had communication with the outside world. We had battery-operated radios and battery-operated record players, and we could buy records in the main town and play them, something that you, nobody would know what it is, like LPs, things that you can hear music um, uh, from. And I had also relatives in Canada, and they would send us things, and I remember receiving a nutcracker once, because until then, the way we crack the nut is to take the nut, a hammer or a rock, and crack it and open it. And I remember also receiving, our family receiving a can opener. The only problem with that is we had no cans to use them in, so we just left it on the shelf as something to admire. Agriculture was pre-industrial, and I'll tell you what my relatives did in order to cut the grain. They would go out with scythes, and cut the grain 
by hand. They would bring it in the stable in what is called the threshing floor. And they would have then the oxen walk on the stable, on the grain, in order to separate the grain from the shaft. And then using a shovel-like instrument, what we call the winnowing fan, they would pick it up, throw it up in the air, wait for a gust of wind to blow to separate the chaff from the grain, and then you'll have the wheat. That was life for uh, me. In school, we only had two teachers and two rooms and for, for uh, school. And the teachers came from a city. They didn't like particularly living with us. And they really couldn't wait until they could go back to the city they found was dull, boring, and dirty peasant children. And I remember every Monday we had to appear in front of the teacher to show that we had actually had changed our clothes because they felt that we were just too dirty. And then the teacher also, when, for example, she was writing on the board, she would come sometimes to one of us and she would wipe the chalk from her fingers on our sweater. And we internalized sometimes this inferiority and thought it was a privilege to get her sort of the chalk on our sweater. And I remember when it was my turn, it was as if the grace of God had entered in me at that particular moment because I felt that modernity and what she represented was really in a sense coming into me because I had heard about what existed outside, but I really couldn't understand that. I knew from relatives that they had televisions in Canada and Germany and Australia, what I had relatives, but I really didn't understand how a television worked, uh, uh, etc. And then so I had this opportunity in 1965, my father who was living then in Canada decided to sponsor us our immigration to Canada. So in August of 1965, we came down the village to the railway station, which was about two miles. Our possessions on carts that were taken by, mule, by mules. And it was a very funereal atmosphere at that time because everybody knew that we were leaving and leaving forever. So everybody knew that we were just getting separated from it. And I remember still being a 10-year-old boy and feeling that my knees were made of ice that were about to melt. I felt so bad that I was leaving my village and everything that I, that I knew. So we came then by ocean liner. It took about seven days and we landed in Halifax, Nova Scotia and took a two, um, I would say two or three day hour train ride to my city where I was introduced to what I would call Western modernity, a place with cars, televisions, toilets, and bathrooms inside the houses. And you know what impressed me the most was the waste of it all. I couldn't believe that when my, all my relatives came to embrace us, everything that they were eating, everything, all the bottles, all the boxes at that particular time were just thrown away. I couldn't believe it that people were throwing away bottles. In the village, we would save the bottles in order to put olive oil or wine or water. We would never throw away anything. But here, this society was throwing everything away. And I was, as I said, slowly then growing up uh, there, getting introduced to this uh, this life, and my fellow classmates could never really understand where I came from. And this is what I mean when I, when I talked about empathy, the capacity to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. They couldn't possibly understand this. I had to translate it for, uh, for them. I was then going to be the intermediary uh, for them. And as I got to know them, I really, as I said, then a teenager, I really wanted to become like them. And this was symbolized for me by craft dinner. 
until then, you know, we had what now, what middle class people want to do, and that is have local cuisine using fresh ingredients, cooking seasonally. That's how we lived in the village. That's how we lived in my own hometown. But I wanted craft dinner because this represented to me the consumerism and the life that I was aspiring to. And I remember then going with my mother and getting craft dinner and then reading for her how we should make it. And I remember this to this, uh, to this day. The other thing and the big thing that I really wanted was the capacity to travel. Because as I came to high school, I was introduced to middle class people. Until then, I was a peasant, which is a form of, of economic categorization, which means that you do consist of uh, agriculture only for yourself. You don't have a surplus to sell. And then when I came to Canada, I became working class. My mother was a dishwasher. My father was a cook, not even a chef in the restaurant. Everybody around me, nobody traveled. My relatives had no concept of travel as something that is a leisure activity. You traveled for a purpose. You emigrated out of poverty. But I was introduced to middle class people and they could travel. They could go to the Caribbean. They could go to Florida. They could go to Vancouver. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to university not to become rich. I wanted to go to university so I could travel like middle class people could. So I did. I studied, and through study abroad and scholarships, I traveled, and I've, tra I've been traveling ever since, as Dr. Rader mentioned, all these places that I've been to. But now I want to, in my summing up comments, talk about the loss that comes through this. Remember when I mentioned to you that that student that had come from Chillicothe, Ohio, and felt that she could never go back to her hometown to live. This means she could never go back to live there and she would be in a sense cut off from this environment. That obviously happened to me. As I said, I changed social classes twice. I was a peasant who became working class, working class who became middle class. That journey you gain through a lot, but it also necessitates that you lose something. And let me tell you then what you end up losing, because when you come into this environment of change, you strike a bargain. And this is true for people that are coming from another class, people that are from a different race, people that come from a more rural environment, and you strike a bargain. The society says, we welcome you to be like us, but you have to change. And in that process, you cast away what it is most familiar to you. And let me tell you then three examples of the way that I became so different that my relatives couldn't always really understand me. I did my PhD in England, and one of the requirements for doing a PhD, you write what is called a dissertation. It's something I worked on three years. It is like a book. I brought it back and showed it to my relatives. And one of my aunts picked it up and she said, Gregory, did you actually type all this? Now, I thought she would say, wow, so you did all this research and you assimilated all this research and you created a book of 350 pages. She couldn't have any idea behind it. The only thing that impressed her was that I actually typed it all. Second example. I, as Dr. Rader mentioned, at middle age, I decided to learn Spanish to see whether you can learn a language in middle age, and it's different from, at 58 is different from 18, so it's better to learn languages now. And in order, I wanted to go and teach in Latin America. I was just about to leave to teach in Buenos Aires for a month. I was chosen for this uh, fellowship, and then my 95-year-old mother had a heart attack and a stroke, which she survived, and now we're going to celebrate her 98th birthday. I was ready to go, I didn't know what to do, and some of my relatives said, well, you know, you're, you're no longer teaching at Ohio State, your semester is over, you're not doing anything, why don't you stay here and take care of your mother? And 
of course, they didn't understand this was very important for me. I already made this decision. I had to go to Buenos Aires. I said, okay, go to Buenos Aires. When you come back in the summertime, you're not doing anything. Why don't you come and take care of your mother? And I felt this horrible feeling one more time because they didn't understand that in the summer I was doing research, I was doing this life of the mind, but for them, if you're not doing practical things, you're doing nothing. I don't blame them. It's just this, we live now in different worlds. They don't understand what I'm doing. And finally, I did return back to my village last year. I had a fellowship at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens doing research for one of my books. And I have three children, but my sons are older, they couldn't come, but my wife and daughter went up to my village. And there were times you know, I saw the very few people that live there uh, right now, and I recognized we live in totally different worlds. They don't understand what I do, they don't understand where I go, they're very proud of me, etc. So I want to sum up by saying that education is really a journey. It's like an odyssey and you really gain a lot of perspectives and ideally, as I said, you should strive for this capacity for empathy, which again, I will define as the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, to know that they have a consciousness, they have a pain, they have a different situation from yours. For people that come, as I said, from a different social classes, as in my case, working class and peasant class, if you come from a different race, if you come from a small town that is not urban, etc., you gain this empathy, but then you lose something. And now, when I'm st standing here in front of you, I can say that for me, I recognize how much I lost, but I think I gained the capacity to understand, to understand so many people and to understand different situations. And if I had a choice to do it all over again, this is what I would do. Uh, in that respect, I recognize the consequences of these moves and decisions, but I am glad that I had the opportunity to leave my village, which meant that I have now this opportunity to talk to you. And I'm very glad I had this chance to do it. Thank you.